Welcome to the Unstructured Podcast. In this episode, I talk with creative director and graphic artist, Allison Ross, founder and janitor at yesterday.rip. Allison's passion for good people, social purpose, and creativity with a healthy dose of humor has led her to work with some of the top design firms and cutting edge brands in the industry. We'll dig into the career path that led her to run her own business, what she learned about remaining true to herself, and the importance of going above and beyond the call of duty. I'm Michelle Rose, and this is Unstructured. This episode was brought to you by Structure Society, the community for creators in art, design, and music. For almost a decade, Structure has brought together creatives from across the industrial, apparel, graphic, and sound design industries, building professional relationships, creating a platform for knowledge sharing, and raising the bar of product creation. From live events and workshops to publication and podcasting, Structure continues to evolve to build the strong creator community needed to craft our future. Find us at struktursociety.com and subscribe to our Substack at structuresociety.substack.com. I want to talk about some of the places that you've worked. Mm -hmm. And um, you've worked at, at several design firms and some brands. I met you when you were working at the brand Now. That's N-A-U. And the way the logo, you know, for the audience, like... It, you know, the, it's flipped. You can, what do they call that? When you like a palindrome, like a palindrome with the logo is done a certain way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and now was, um, and I think you came to speak for structure, you know, years after now had started. Yep. And, um, but I, and I had known about them pretty early on, um, because they were a really distinct, brand that was based in, uh, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about it, but based in sustainability uh, and trying to bring sustainability to a kind of petroleum-based outdoor synthetic market, but also a look that was um, trying to get something a bit more urban, you know, that you can wear every day. They were one of the very first brands to do that. Um, and um, we, as designers, we all love that. Because that was that feeling of, oh, the art and science coming together. If we can get some fashion into the performance so we don't look like we're crunchy outdoor. Now everybody wants to look crunchy outdoor for the fashion. But back then it was definitely different. Um, so that was a very important brand for a lot of us, which is also they were very design focused, which is why we would have them at Structure. So I wanted to know a little bit about your experience with them, like how you found them, how they found you, you know, and, and um, you know, what you liked about working with them or what you experienced and got in working with that, a brand that was doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Same as you. I feel like even in the graphic design world, branding world, everybody knew about now when they first came out. I mean, it was a basically a super group that came together to, right. to create the brand and, you know, it was like, we don't put logos on our gear. We don't, like, it was the anti-brand brand. So I, I was definitely aware of now and really respected the brand and all of that. And then this was after my time at JDK. And I, like, kind of, I went to Japan for a couple of months and then came back and was trying to figure out what was next. And then had heard that they were looking for a creative director I went in and spoke with the team like loved them immediately from the start and uh yeah I was like are you guys sure like I'm I'm gonna be weird and wacky and they're like yeah, yeah yeah totally this is this is perfect so yeah I joined the team and at that time too because this was after my time at JDK I was like I don't I don't think I'm ready for another design studio so this idea to go work in-house mm -hmm. was really awesome uh, and ended up being like a real 
exercise in client empathy that I've like carried forward since on just understanding how a brand works from the inside out Mm -hmm. instead of being an outside brand consultant. And then, of course, the job creative director at a branding studio is very different from being one at a fashion brand. So that was it was cool. It was like a really steep learning curve and, you know, a place where my peers were, you know, I was on the leadership team. So my peers were a wholesale guy and a product guy, an e-com guy, a marketing guy. They were all guys. So, (laughs) but yeah, it was cool. It was, it was awesome. And, and that's, that's the difference is you, you were always working for a design firm yeah. You know, that worked with multiple brands. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those in a minute. But um, this was one where you had to go in and be focused on one brand all the time. Yeah. And in every way. Yeah. Yeah. And it was super fun <laughs> because, you know, sometimes we would come up with, you know, ideas for our communications or campaigns. <clears throat> and, I'd be like, ooh, this would be really cool. And then I would look around, who needs to approve it? Oh yeah, me, this is so great. <laughs> so we did, we, we were able to do a lot of fun stuff while, while I was there, we had a lot of fun. And how was the brand, the brand, um, like what point was it at? Because, uh, you know, I've been following them for, for years until they were, they were bought. Um, and I don't follow them, you know, nearly as much, obviously, but a lot of it was because of the people and the design, but where were they at at that point? So they, you know, basically their brand strategy was unfuck the world Mm -hmm. (laughs) and not too, too much else codified around that. And so I, you know, part of the work that I did there was, you know, redefining or redoing the brand strategy, which ended up being instead of unfuck the world, it was um, sustainability comes standard. So that was just something so true to the brand in its current state and that the entire industry needed to like step up to. So that was really, that was like pretty meaningful and fun. And that, that was my first time again, pivoting out of just general youth culture design into something that really had, you know, sustainability at its core impact at its core. Mm -hmm. So and that brand, I mean, they've always had, because they were one of the first to do it mm-hmm. and really make it standard, main, uh, trying to make it mainstream, and but still at that time going upstream. And so what was that like at that point? Um, was it frustrating in terms of trying to get the message across and have people buy it that's, and accept it? Got it. Yeah, that's a really good question because the world is so different today Mm -hmm. it was so ahead of its time and I remember you know making the point and I think it's still valid today is that when I joined the team in like 2014 everybody understands the benefits of organic food Mm -hmm. because you put it in your body and it can either make you sick or not sick Um, everyone then also understood Uh, At the time, there was just hybrid cars coming out. Mm -hmm. Everyone understood, like, sure, it's the eco thing to do, but I only have to spend half as much at the pump. When it comes to clothing, it's I think it's still hard for people to understand the benefits and the, the impact. I think there's more communications about the impact at the landfills that people are starting to understand, but... You know, the materials that are used that are like beyond toxic, but people still put on their body. Mm -hmm. I think people still kind of have the blinders up when it comes to the impact of textiles and things. Well, the whole uh, the whole process of designing and creating and making and shipping apparel is incredibly complicated. It's hard for anybody who's working, even working in it to understand it, let alone people who are buying it. And it's just too many too many uh, choices and responsibilities to, to, and then how do you know where to go? Um, and so I think like with, with now, like, you know, trying to educate customers, but then also just trying to to appeal to them with the look 
and it had a distinct, unusual look. It wasn't necessarily um, accessible to the masses. It was very design focused. So people who love design loved now and we understood the message behind it. And I think customers are more educated now, um, but looks have changed too, right? And materials and they're constantly evolving, but it, it just, it played such an important role and it, you know, it still does, but at the time it broke through a lot of things. Oh yeah. So. Again, it was, it was founded by a super group of people who were tired of the status quo of that industry and just wanted to create you know, they were all a bunch of designers and they just wanted to create the clothing that they were like, why doesn't this exist in the world? Why can't we do this in a way that doesn't fuck over the world? Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like it's it's era that it had was like really special. And I feel very lucky to have been a part of that. Yeah, so absolutely. and it and it definitely shifted. Um, well, I learned so much about again manufacturing or like anything that I picked up from the geniuses that I worked with but um yeah that whole like the importance of sustainability and yeah yeah I was gonna say like um like how did working with them inform your creative voice going forward then how did it shift what did it add or what did it take away I mean I think for for the actual my actual creative voice probably turning down the swear words a little bit <laughs> maybe oh, really? maybe using them a little no I'm joking they're <laughs> they were they were a pretty rowdy bunch too I, I would think so yeah um I think I I think the biggest thing that it that it permanently imprinted on me is to like I was saying a little bit earlier, make sure to give more to the world than take from it, you know? So, and I mean that on like a resource level, for sure. Because there you're dealing with um, physical product and yeah. things that have a physical impact versus just messages. Yeah. Not that some of the other design firms you might've worked with wouldn't have done that as well. Mm -hmm. But th this is front and center. Yeah, huge. And then Again, the, another huge thing that I got from there is just the empathy of like how much fucking shit you need to make to get your story out there. And the day to day, you know, I, I think for anyone who works in an in-house position, uh, just to understand all the bits and pieces you have to create to just get people to pay attention. So it was more there than working. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. I feel like when um whether it's consulting or working on the studio side, you kind of say like, here's the big story. Okay, good luck. And then, you know, an internal team needs to take that and be like, uh, that's not really going to sell our stuff. So they need to like refine it. And Yeah. yeah. And now you're res or when working with a, a specific brand, you're responsible for the result and having to come back and update and change and, and see what worked and what didn't a bit more. Exactly. So having, I feel like now when I approach work for brands, I'm like hyper aware of like, well, what's this going to mean for your like, you know, email strategy type thing? And like, how are you going to talk about this same uh, backpack to hit all of your audiences, not just like that one aspirational one? Like, how do you talk to blah, 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 things like that? So how was, now let's talk about the firm, working for design firms. You've worked for a few. Yep. And, um, you know, yeah, take us through some of those between, I think JDK was your first one. Yeah. And and then, where'd you go after JDK? You went to? I went to Now after JDK, then BBMG, and BBMG. then Super Union. Oh, yeah. God. And so Now was sandwiched between the two. Yeah. Um, how, so that, that's a great experience there. So you have JDK, let's talk about, you know, some of the early things that you loved there, what you learned kind of, and then, then you get to go to BBMG after now. Let's go into those. Two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, JDK was wonderful. Um, that was again, the, my, my post pharmaceutical, my next step and, 
uh, based out of Burlington, Vermont. And, you know, I feel like back in the day, everyone applied there because Burton, 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 designing snowboards, you know, that's really, I think that's what attracted a lot of the design team there. Just mm -hmm. the ability to like create art on a snowboard. What? Cool. So yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like, <clears throat> Yeah, I really, I grew up as a designer there. I was there for like nine years. and a long time. A really long time. I loved it, though. I loved, the people were fantastic. Um, I'm still so close with everyone there, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. And uh, yeah, we did a lot of like cool stuff together um, from like Burton and Nike and Lululemon and Xbox and North Face and Planned Parenthood yeah. was a project that I got to work on there, which was so cool, so much fun. But yeah, JDK was awesome for sure. And again, like a huge like growth mm -hmm. um, kind of runway for me there. There's nothing quite like the first the first place you work. Know. You know, that foundation for, you know, I had that as well, not for quite nine years, I think five or six for my first one, but it's like your family, your first, you know, your first building up all your first relationships. Yeah. I think it's also, I feel like everyone or most people that I speak to that, you know, I've worked there with remembers it so fondly. And I think it's because you're young, you have a lot of energy, there's not really much to do in Vermont. <laughs> um, no, there's a ton to do in Vermont. Uh, you know, a, a lot of us at the time were single, definitely not married, not with kids or any of that stuff. Um, and also, I think, especially for young designers, there's like such a special time when you get to grow and focus on the work and there are people above you taking care of the bullshit of business, you know, or just the, the housekeeping of it. So, yeah, I don't know. I look back on that time really fondly and, you know, I was there, I started as a designer and then a senior designer and then a design director there. Um, so I, I, I like that I got to experience a lot of different layers and be able to work with you know, the new school of people that were coming in and be like, I want to make this awesome for you. That right. feeling of your, your growth, the path of your growth. Yeah. And, you know, having, I don't know if you had mentors or great people leading you through, that makes a big difference. Yeah, huge. So. And it was, <laughs> the mentorship came after, it was my second year there and I had my first ever bad review. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, I had been on a team working on a pretty challenging project and I can't remember exactly what made it so challenging, like whether it was how the team was built or timelines or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, probably over delivering and things like that, like designers are so good at doing. Yes. But, uh, you know, the entire team had a bit of like a sour taste in our mouths a bit afterwards. And that sourness kind of stuck with me for a few months and then it was review time and people were like you're like kind of kind of suck to work with you're so you have this like oh. sourness and I was like what oh. I, I had worked like oh. I know it painful. I, I know it, it was so painful and I was like why didn't you guys tell me this like nine months ago when it was happening they're like oh we just do these once a year I was like, uh, okay, cool. So you saved it up for them. I know. And I was like, oh. okay, cool. Well, with me, we're going to be doing these every three months. And you, I'm meeting with you once a week to talk about goals. And at that moment, I like took ownership of my own growth. I'm not saying I'm owning the growth that I made. I just took the reins of it and like forced people or asked like, people, please, can you support me? Like I need to reverse whatever the last nine months were as quickly as possible. And, and that really, that was a huge lesson. And, um, I, I think was a, a giant factor in like my growth after that, because very quickly 
it changed and then promotions began and that kind uh-huh. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it feels like, like, I know I would feel mortified if, if something had happened, especially nine months ago Yeah, and I didn't hear about it and I just kept, I was allowed to keep going. Mm-hmm. And then when you feel like, well, I could have, I didn't know that I could have shifted something. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, this was also, you know, a long time ago and, and, you know, I feel like Nobody, a lot of people don't like having that difficult conversation with someone, but other people are very direct and to the point and will do that to avoid um, something that might feel like this yeah. later. That's probably a big factor in my directness as yeah. well. I mean, and that speaks to your character too of, of you know, wanting to not have those things happen or wanting to do well so that you can get on top of it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's not necessarily about, um, you know, wanting to make sure you never do anything that bothers people or whatnot. Um, it's just more of wanting to have a regular open line of communication. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I just think it, it, it's more effective. It, it, so it, it, it resonates with me as um, a really good practice. I don't think it's necessarily easy to do, too, to have to check in all the time and be able to willingly hear what's going on, how is it going. Two-way street feedback. Oh, I I love it. (laughs) I love having reviews. I love giving reviews. I love, yeah, I love it. There's like, nah, all we want to do is make the best work ever and if there's just if there's like a quirk that needs to be worked on to make that smoother and better i am down like i'm i love it yeah that's a great way to get ahead of it because i i don't know too many people that would necessarily say they love it (laughs) oh i do well i'm Mm -hmm. like such a um growth 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 person Mm -hmm. you know yeah um I, I had another another question that I'd written down here, um, and I had said, uh, thinking of that growth and the successes and failures, and I have always been, uh, where I, I'm really intrigued by your career uh, in terms of the successes and the failures um, and the risks that you've been willing to take. That mix of rapid growth, promotions, you know, we talked about plateauing out, um, but then also being let go, you know, like, like, like having that mix of, of rapid growth and great support and then also being fired, mm-hmm. you know, because we tend to kind of think, oh, fire is bad. You know, this is great. And if you're doing this, then you're this kind of person. If you get fired, you're this kind of person. It, it's not black and white. You know, and I've heard these stories from other people that I've talked to or guests or whatnot. Um, some of the most amazing and talented people that have really inspired me have stories of, oh, I, I get fired all the time. That, I, I grew up with a terrible fear of getting fired and I never did get fired. I've been let go once. And when I finally did get let go, which was more of a layoff, I recognized how important it was for me to have that happen and that I probably actually should have gone through getting fired. I did quit a really important job at the top of my game when I didn't plan on quitting. Um, And that felt like firing them, which felt really empowering too. But that piece of being let go um, was really important for me to let go of that fear of of feeling like other people controlled my destiny um, and being okay with it. Like I survived, you know, like I'm okay, but I just felt like I didn't take risks. The reason that those things, because of that, the fear of that type of thing happening, um, it kept me from taking risks that I wish I had taken. And so, you know, wanting to look at that, is there something that, well, what did I say? It tells me that there's something you're doing right in defining your voice that, you know, and your vision, you know, like there's a way that you're defining who you are that either works for a company or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it's okay. Mm -hmm. 
moving on. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What are some of your key learnings in being let go or being promoted? Because it might be the same type of thing on either side, yeah. you know? I feel like any time, it's interesting, being promoted and being let go uh, both cause emotions. And what's interesting is that the volume of those emotions, though, are so uh, polar opposite. Like being promoted, some people might be like, you know, my parents might be like, oh, my God, that's amazing. But it's like, no, getting promoted is a such a gradual process. And it's just a moment where it's been validated that you are performing above whatever your title or whatever your role is that it's like, okay, well, now we want you to take on these other, we want to give you a new job, new job description, where in addition to what you were doing, you have these, these extra responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when a person is promoted, I feel like normally it's like a decision. Well, do I want to take on those extra responsibilities? Yeah. Okay. I do. All right, let's go. So from Friday afternoon to Monday morning, there's not really, you know, it's, uh, you know, you're, it's wonderful to feel validated and to see the, the fruition of all the work that you've put in to try and grow and rise up if that's what you want to do. And then when it comes to letting go, obviously that feels like shit at first. So for, for me, that was my experience at Super Union. And um, yeah, it feels awful at first because someone else just made a decision for you when you were like, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm, I'm committed to. And then they're like, nope, goodbye. Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes back to the, the comment that I had made of, you know, what will I never do again is show up to an interview and tone it down because yeah. they don't want their conference room destroyed yeah. had I done that they wouldn't have called me back for another interview yeah. right. so you know I'm I can be I'm as a designer I'm good at presenting and selling through mm -hmm. so like I, I think I did a pretty successful job at seeming like smart and creative and not a jerk mm -hmm. But I think once they got the full picture, they were kind of like, whoa, this, this is, yeah, this what is what we signed up for. <laughs> our clients don't like you. <laughs> it's like, oh, OK. Yeah. So, yeah. well, no, uh, they they had basically, you know, just said you're, you're not the right fit. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that was it. How and long have you had you been there when that happened? Six months. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty it was pretty quick. Um and yeah, I feel like the work we were doing, there was, there was two projects in particular that I was, I was a good fit for. Mm -hmm. I love the clients. Clients appreciated my personality, but then there were other clients that it was a tough mm -hmm. fit for sure. Yeah. yeah, no reverse swear jars, <laughs> that's for sure. And is this because they didn't quite, well, I think you had said this, that, that, they didn't quite see all of you or know who or did they know what they were signing up for and it just was more than they thought? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah de I, I think um, I'm trying to think back now because from JDK to now, I was super upfront with them. I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm a weirdo. And they're like, yeah, we're we're a bunch of weirdos, too. So it's OK. Uh from now to BBMG, there is actually an old JDK intern who was working at BBMG that was like, you know, I had applied and she was like, I've worked with her. She's fucking amazing. So hmm. it's interesting. Almost, it's almost like that kind of friends don't let friends. So, you know, uh -huh. there, there was already like a bit of understanding of like, she's nuts, but in a good way, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And then, yeah, poor Super Union. 
didn't didn't get the memo. Didn't get the memo. I know. Mm. But mm. yeah. I even in the six months I was there though, like there were there were a lot of really, really talented people that worked there that I'm still in contact with. And then and then some others that I'm not, but that's okay. <laughs> I think we need to have those. Um, it's interesting because I do see, uh, for myself and for a lot of people that I talk to, we have this a handful of places we've worked, you know, some people have worked for a lot. Some people have worked for a few, um, but we all have kind of a handful. It's kind of like relationships and, yeah. and, and jobs, right? And they have a similar trajectory. There's that, that first one that's kind of like your first love and it's really special. And you're like, there's, you know, it, it like I said, it's not this way for everybody, but then you get to go to some more seasoned ones and you have these big growth experiences. And then somewhere along the line, you start kind of hitting, hitting the real world. I mean, not that you hadn't before, but especially when you're in those leadership roles, you know, and you start, to, uh, you know, kind of button heads more and everything gets a little bit more adult and, and beyond. And so then, and then, you know, the, um, the honeymoon is way over by then and the real work comes in and then you start to really decide or, or distinguish who your, you know, who your friends are, who those colleagues, who, who has your back, you know, and who you knew, who you know and whatnot. Let me add one yes. last tidbit about the, the being let go when, when I was saying the emotional part of it, of it's like, whoa, it's a shock. It's sad. Every, I feel like when it comes as a surprise for anyone, it's like, it's fucking hard. It is not, it does not feel good. And, um, only until you get to that next thing that brings you so much joy, then you're able to look at it and like, kind of be like, Oh, whatever. Or like, thank goodness, you know, they did me a favor, that kind of thing. So just throwing it out there. Cause again, I I'm so empathetic with how many people are are in that position right now yeah. um and that the next yeah just pick that next thing yeah. carefully this episode was brought to you by the functional fabric fair powered by performance days the premier trade show for performance fabrics and materials since 2018, the Functional Fabric Fair has been providing a unique, highly curated trade show experience in the performance materials space, aimed at providing customers with the very best options to create the highest level products in the market. Having a strong focus on education and sustainability, the Functional Fabric Fair is committed to tackling the biggest issues we face today in regards to product manufacturing and our environment. With five shows throughout the year from Portland to New York City to Munich, you're sure to find what you need at the Functional Fabric Fair and Performance Days. So now I wanted to check in and ask you about starting your own business. I wanted to know why you started it and why you call it what you call it, which is yesterday, um, why did I start it? I feel like you said earlier, uh, there are roles and places that you work at that are like, oh, the first one, the first love. And then, yeah. And then there's some experiences are the ones that break you. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I was at that point. I had never imagined starting my own thing. And it was really two, uh, good friends and mentors in particular who kind of pushed shoved me off that that edge and uh they were really supportive of me and very helpful as I like ironed out the details so it was really just you know because of the situation I was in and wanting to prioritize working with friends wanting to prioritize keeping all toxicity out of life and work so yeah that's kind of I reluctantly started it, and I think, you know, two months in, I was like, this is, okay, this might work. This is cool. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us start things reluctantly. Yeah, totally. Because we have to. Yeah. Right? Because yeah, yeah. it's terribly scary. Mm -hmm. to, it's terrifying to jump out on your own. It is, yeah. What made you think it would start to work? Uh, 
from the time I started, I've been busy since. So it's it's just been really great. And, you know, always being hesitant at first of like, will people remember working with me? Is my network healthy enough for this? And yeah, I was very lucky that that mine was. And the reason it's called yesterday, I feel like I've done a great job at post rationalizing it, but the which I will do after I tell you really where it's from, which is uh, at one point, uh, me and my then partner were had realized like one of our friends had registered a domain for himself, jamesbailey.rip, and we thought it was hilarious. So we each, like I bought alisonross.rip because I'm like, this is so funny. What am I going to do with it? I haven't done anything with it yet, but... Uh, but then we were going through all these other words like fun.rap, donaldtrump.rap, like all, all kinds of different ones. So we, we were kind of sitting at dinner, you know, having a drink and just going on like a, a sh he was going on a, a domain shopping rampage and it was hilarious. And then he said, oh, yesterday.rap. And I was like, wink. I like that one. So he I just came up with out, out of the, he, out of the yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we were saying like today dot rep, tomorrow dot rep, yesterday dot rep, and I thought it was so funny. So yeah, that's the truth behind it. It was just one big joke, and then the post rationalized is basically, you know, the way that the way that things used to be done doesn't mean they have to be done like that today or tomorrow, mm -hmm. and I think you know the the way that I run yesterday is like we're really small and I pull in friends that I love spending time with like strategists photographers videographers illustrators designers and just build out little super teams for the right projects so again like just working with friends both client wise partner wise and um yeah I it's so nice to every day work with people that you're like, I would, I do hang out with you or I would hang out with you. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, the title really makes sense too, <laughs> you know, cause it's, we're moving on, you know, think forward. Oh my gosh. A friend of mine just got it tattooed on her arm, which is <laughs> like cool. very humbling. She's like, can I get this tattoo? Aww. I'm like, yeah, go for it. Oh, that's sweet. That's yeah. Sweet. Speaking of that, I want to, you know, friends and, and kind of doing things. I want to, I want to wrap up our conversation on something that we talked a little bit about before, which was that not just the going above and beyond or putting everything in, but doing things for people, you know, without anything in return. And one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, what you've done for structure, because that's my experience with it. And, you know, I've asked you to be part of structure three different times. Uh, before this, prior to this, this is the fourth time. And each time you've done something unique and unusual and extra that you didn't need to do. You know, I think the first one. Girl, right? you really did not need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, but, but it added. I mean, it made a difference. Yeah, totally. It, it, I get it. Yeah. It made a difference to, you know, your connection with the audience and, and to the piece. And it was memorable. Um, but it also shows that it, what it really shows is that giving side. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that you didn't need to do is that you did it out of that goodness of your heart that you wanted to. Meaning, you know, your, your speaking fee for the very first one, you use the whole speaking fee to buy, you know, what, what, um, hot water music. Charles Bukowski, yep. baby. Yep. yep. For everybody in the audience. Yeah. And so you <laughs> handed that book out to everyone. Yeah. And that was part of the, the talk, but everyone also walked away with something. It reminds them of that and, and they can get what they want out of it. The, the second time I asked you to be part of structure series and um, you had a, a co-guest and you really wanted to, you know, really play with the image, the imagery of the dark and the light and the white and the black because of, of, of who you both were. Um, and you had really wonderful photos taken, you know, from, from uh, I believe, a photographer friend of yours and whatnot, but that you use of their professional shots and you really crafted them and, and orchestrated them. And it just was beautiful. It created something really unique and um, an artistic side that we hadn't really spent time focusing on yet. 
And then for coming to structure last year when we relaunched live, which was a very uh, challenging thing for me to try to do during the pandemic, you agreed to speak or run a panel, but you amongst all of the structure supporters and speakers you know, we're a really strong part of, yes, we, let's get this going. I want to be part of it. And you decided to show up and be there and be part of it and make it happen. And, um, you know, all of those things are really, really important for structure. Um, and so that piece of that giving is something that is a part of you. And you have said you have been both um, praised and criticized for that. I wanted you to see what you had to say to speak about that piece. Yeah, I feel like uh, anytime someone asks me to be a part of something, I get it's very humbling that you would even want to hear anything. So um, yeah, I think doing those things too, I always, in anything that I approach, it's like, okay, if I do exactly what's on the brief, that'll work, but whoa, what if I did this instead? Like the books, for example, at the first structure event, I, I didn't think I was getting paid for it. So when all of a sudden there was like a compensation, I was like, well, I was going to do this anyway. So everybody else will benefit from it, you know? So I don't know. And I feel like, you know, in, you know, choosing to meet in person or, or travel across the country instead of doing something on Zoom is, you know, I did that for some lectures uh, that I was doing. It just, I think, I don't know, whenever you can go above and beyond the brief, <laughs> um, for me anyway, it, it becomes stickier in my brain. I remember it more. And I really, I fucking love dog and pony shows. Most of these things are, are done within like the professional context and work and, and showing up for people personally as well. So the praise is always, you know, when the work side of it goes good or it's so memorable or we win the pitch or get invited back to speak somewhere. Um, so that positive feedback is obviously the, the praise that I'm talking about. The criticism is more... Um, people behind the scenes who are like, you're tired, you're stressed, like stop. You know, you don't have to fly across the country, just do it on Zoom. Like you don't have to, you know, put together that like crazy presentations, just design, whatever. So I think it the criticism isn't, it's not meant in a, mean way it's meant in a caring way so I think it's just it's just that like the overextension sometimes and you know I think we had mentioned you know you do you overextend a hundred times and maybe it comes back to you once or something in return so but again I think I I I love going beyond the brief so it's just something that brings me yeah joy I love it and yeah, supporting people, taking care of people. It's great. It's awesome. That's what I was going to ask you is why do you do it? Why, why is that important to you? you when you can kind of take the shortcut on, or take the easy route? Because uh, you don't remember the easy route. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like even through this conversation, reflecting back on an interview that was like, what? I'm, I'm proud of moments like that, so. And people remember moments like that. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they like them or not, they remember them. <laughs> I feel like most of the time, people on the receiving end of it like them, and yeah, or 50%, or they don't, who knows? If anything, they remember it. Yeah. And that is like, as you were saying, it's, it's the thing that's not boring, mm -hmm. you know? It's whether or not it has meaning, to other people, it has meaning to you. Mm -hmm. And when it has meaning to you, you know, then other people can find their own meaning. We, we find our meaning where we look for it. Yeah. Final thoughts. Last words. Oh, last words. Last words. Dot R-I-P. <laughs> uh, yes. 
two things, and they're both quotes. So love quotes. Um, the first one is a Keanu Reeves quote, fellow Canadian. I know, the, it's like, uh-oh, point break, what's coming? <laughs> Bill and Ted. Uh, it's a Keanu Reeves quote uh, that I heard last year that r really floored me when I heard it. And he was asked by someone, what happens after you die? Mm -hmm. And I think the person was trying to fish out some like religious or spiritual mm -hmm. thing. And his response was, uh, when you die, those that love you will miss you very much. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, every human has dealt with the grief of losing someone or will at some point. And uh, for me personally, that helped, helped me get through something that had been, you know, I had been grieving for uh, several years uh, mm -hmm. of a friend passing away. And when I heard that, I was like, that is true. And that's what I'm feeling. And that's okay. So that's, that's, one thing, I know, very kind of off topic, but it's something that I heard. And uh, if it helps anyone else, uh, you know, put it out there. And then, <laughs> and then the, the second one is uh, don't fake the funk on a nasty dunk. And that's Shaquille O'Neal <laughs> from like the 90s. <laughs> wow. I don't remember that one. Yeah. Say it again. Uh, don't fake the funk on a nasty dunk. What does that mean? If you're doing a I'm shitty dunk, don't like act like it's really good. He was like the best dunker. Yes. He, he's the one that would like smash the glass and everything. So yeah, there you go. Don't fake the funk. Yeah. <laughs> dunk. yeah. Be true to yourself on all levels. Mm -hmm. And go smash backboards. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> do that. <laughs> You have been listening to Unstructured, the podcast from Structure Society. If you enjoyed this episode, please download, share, like, subscribe, and add your thoughts and suggestions in the comments. Also, please consider a Substack paid subscription to help us bring even more meaningful content and connection points to you and our creator community. Here, you'll find articles and news, as well as the podcast and additional content. We cannot grow without you. Thanks for listening and talk to you soon.